Well, welcome to this first broadcast from Christ College Chapel for Lent term 2021. Uh, another term, another lockdown with all the challenges that involves, another return to YouTube. Uh, the broadcast this term will fall into three parts. Uh, we're going to spend some time exploring what the Bible tells us specifically about prayer, uh, and that will occupy us for the next four weeks or so. Uh, we'll then spend some time actually praying, uh, and then we'll close with a recording uh, of the chapel choir from last term. But let me start our time this evening with the collect for this Sunday. Almighty and everlasting God, mercifully look upon our infirmities and in all our dangers and necessities stretch forth thy right hand to help and defend us through jesus christ our lord amen and now matthias one of our finalists is going to bring us our reading a reading from the letter to the hebrews chapter 4 verses 14 to 16. therefore since we have a great high priest who has ascended into heaven Jesus the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to feel sympathy for our own weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Here ends the lesson. Oh my God, not another strain of COVID. Oh my God, not another lockdown. Oh my God, not another six months of this. Now I'm sure these statements have been spoken in various forms across the nation many times over the past month or so. These comments reflect our shared frustration and weariness with the current situation. But by invoking God, oh my God, deliberately or otherwise, they reflect possibly the extent to which we have apparently become more prayerful as a nation under COVID. According to various polls, one in four of adults in the UK have watched or listened to a religious service since the lockdowns first began, and one in 20 have started praying during the crisis. Uh, and when the Church of England began a new prayer hotline, ever at the forefront of technological innovation, 6,000 people phoned in the first 48 hours. But even without the prompts of COVID, polling over the last decade suggests that the reports of the death of prayer in modern Britain have been greatly exaggerated. It is, after all, a common instinct to every human society in some form. But admittedly, praying might seem a little bit weird. Um, in other circumstances, sitting and seeming to talk to thin air perhaps using archaic words that you wouldn't normally use, might be considered a little eccentric. And yet, faced with a cold, dark winter in the middle of a global catastrophe, we might think, well, praying certainly couldn't make things any worse. And so over the next few weeks, we're going to spend a bit of time thinking about prayer. For those of us who pray, what do we think is actually going on? And for those of us who do not, or perhaps think that we might like to pray but aren't sure what on earth it involves, why should we bother? Now last term we looked at the basics of the Christian faith, what it is, how it fits together, the architecture if you like. This term we're going to think about how we actually enter the building. Um, as with any architecture we can stand on the outside in admiration or we can push on the door and see what it's like inside. And with Christianity that means engaging with prayer. But before turning to the passage we just heard, let's think about how the modern world sometimes sees prayer. Now, some of you will know I am a big fan of Terry Pratchett and Discworld. And in one of his novels, Terry Pratchett describes praying as like trying to negotiate with a thundercloud. His characteristically playful phrase captures a lot of what prayer can seem like um, in the modern world. A thundercloud is obviously an inanimate object. It cannot hear us, it cannot change its course in response to us. There's no reason to expect negotiations with a thundercloud to work. Such negotiations are simply expressions of our frustration with a universe full of random events that could not care less about us. It's just something we feel we ought to do. 
And as a result, a lot of thinking about prayer in the modern world from a variety of faith traditions often makes prayer about ourselves. If prayer has a purpose, it's about centering our own lives, ordering our own thoughts and aspirations, remembering our own place in the universe. We can't control the metaphorical thunderclouds of our lives, but we can at least perhaps control ourselves. Let's now turn to our passage from Hebrews and see what it has to say. It's from an anonymous letter written to a Christian community somewhere in the Mediterranean in the very early days of the church. Um, it is a cracking letter, Hebrews, of which these verses are just a tiny slice. Now, I should like to focus on just the final verse of our passage, verse 16. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Now, even though the author doesn't use the word prayer, this verse is one of the most profound statements about prayer in the whole Bible, and there is some competition for that claim. It is an invitation, a call on this letter's first readers and on us to pray. And four elements in this verse deserve our immediate attention. Firstly, this verse mentions our time of need. Um, and in this sense, the modern thinking on prayer, negotiating with underclouds, is onto something. Praying is partly about us. The only reason to try negotiating with a thundercloud is because we need it not to rain. And the letter to the Hebrews agrees in part. We pray because we need something. We pray because we lack whatever it is that we need, and we lack what we hope the verse describes as finding and receiving. To what then does this time of need refer? What is it that we need? Is it simply when we're feeling run down and hard done by? Is it when we're at our wit's end? Well, absolutely. Uh, but our time of need is not necessarily confined to moments of acute crisis. We are always in need of something. Oxygen, water, food, shelter. And every day we have needs that we seek to fulfil. Deadlines that need meeting, chores that need doing. And finally and fundamentally, we need friendship, community. Our lives need purpose and value if they are to be at all satisfying. And as I'm sure we're all very tired of realising, Covid and its implications have exposed our vulnerability, our neediness as human beings. And even at the best of times, we make ourselves so very busy, so sick with stress and anxiety, because whatever we do have, it doesn't quite satisfy our needs. It always seems like we need more. That's the first point, that we constantly find ourselves in a time of need. The second element to note is God's throne of grace. And this is where the Bible starts to differ from modern thinking about prayer, because prayer isn't just about us. It's not about us getting our heads straight or finding some peace and quiet. It is fundamentally about a relationship, a conversation, with the God who is there and is not silent. A thundercloud, by contrast, is an inanimate object, part of the apparently random processes of the universe. And yet, and we spent a lot of time last term thinking about this, we cannot fully account for the universe without something greater and fundamentally different. Now, I don't know what you imagine when you hear the word God, but the Bible often shows us God as a king, and as a king asks us to conceive him as sitting on a throne, ruling and governing all creation with majesty and power, not as a tyrant or despot, but as perfectly fair and just and sovereign. In other words, if being human means being in need, then God is the exact opposite. He lacks nothing, he needs nothing, he is perfectly and completely self-sufficient, the God without whom nothing would exist. And this is a theme of so many of those great hymns, which I'm sure we're looking forward to singing again. Hymns that evoke awe and reverence at the splendour of this heavenly majesty. But if we take the images in those hymns um, and in much of the Bible seriously, it might make us a little, well, 
wary of God. There is clearly a gap between us and God. There is a gap in what we can each bring to the table. We have nothing but our need. God has everything except for needs. And this brings us on to the third element in this verse, which is what the verse invites us to do. Let us then approach God's throne. In other words, in our time of need, let us pray to this God who sits on the throne. And why? Because he alone is able to truly meet all of our needs. It is in God's throne room and God's throne room alone that we can receive mercy and find grace to help us. It is in God's throne room that we can receive what we need and find what we lack. Because as the sovereign king over all creation, God not only lacks nothing, but he can provide everything and anything. God is not an inanimate object like a thundercloud, but a personal God who listens and hears and answers. Now, mercy and grace might not be at the top of our wish list, um, but those words do not so much describe the content of what God provides as the purpose when he does provide. Mercy and grace denote help that is undeserved and unearned. Help, in whatever form it takes, that is given solely from his love for us, according to our need, not according to our merits. And this brings us on to our final point, that we are to approach God's throne of grace with confidence, boldly. Now, don't miss the tension here. God is a king on a throne. We are creatures in need. And yet here we are told to approach this throne boldly and confidently. We might ask, how is this possible? Surely God expects a bit of groveling. Well, no, we are told that we can pray expecting to be heard and confident of an answer. Unlike negotiating with thunderclouds, God gives us every reason to be sure that praying does something. And it's not just because we're talking to an actual being who can answer. It's because we are talking to a God who wants to answer. It's because God delights to hear us, to talk to us, to answer us, because he loves us. And the assurance he gives for this is nothing less than his own son, Jesus Christ. Verses 14 and 15 of our passage describe how Jesus, while God's Son, enthroned with him in heaven, is also one of us. He understands what it is to be in need. He can sympathise with our weaknesses. And as a high priest, evoking the imagery of the temple in Jerusalem, he takes us by the hand and leads us into God's throne room. He stands with us, as we bring our weaknesses and our needs and our fears to the king of the universe. Whatever our failings, whatever our fears, whatever our needs, we can approach God's throne through Jesus. This is why when Christians pray, we do so in Christ's name or for the sake of Jesus. If you listen to the prayers at Evensong, most of them end with that kind of phrase. And this is why. Because Christ is how God assures us that he will listen. Not just listen as a ruler giving us a fair hearing. No, but as a loving and generous father. And he does not just listen, but answers according to our needs. Whether those needs do involve tangible things like essay deadlines or job interviews, or big things like medical operations or family problems, or global things like lockdowns and vaccines. Most of all, what he gives us is himself and his grace in our need. A startling forgiveness of everything that would separate us from him. An unconquerable love that we all so desperately need. And an amazing relationship that we did not realise that we lacked. The next week we'll think a bit more about how we go about praying and dig a bit deeper into the conversation that God invites with himself. First, having thought about prayer, uh, let us actually turn to pray. Almighty and everlasting God, you are always more ready to hear us than we are to pray, and always ready to give more than we e either desire or deserve. We come before your throne of grace now, mindful of our needs, but confident in your promise to hear us through Jesus Christ. 
We seek your mercy and grace to help us at this time. Keep us, good Lord, under the shadow of your mercy in this time of uncertainty and distress. Sustain and support, we ask, all of us and all those whom we know. Make us bold, make bold all those who are anxious and fearful. Make firm and secure all who are brought low and assure us of the love and grace you offer us through Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. God of compassion, be close to those who are ill, afraid or in isolation. In their loneliness be their consolation, in their anxiety be their hope, in their darkness be their light. Through him who suffered alone on the cross, but reigns with you in glory, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. For medical staff and volunteers, gracious God, give skill, sympathy and resilience to all those who are caring for the sick and all those involved in delivering vaccines. Strengthen them with your spirit, that through their work many will be restored to health and protected for the future, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And for all those who are ill, especially those known to us in our own community, Merciful God, we entrust them to your tender care, knowing that whenever danger threatens, your everlasting arms are there to hold them safe. Comfort and heal them, and restore them to health and strength, through Christ our Lord. Amen. We're going to close our time of prayer with the two collects traditionally prayed towards the end of the evensong service. O God, from whom all holy desires, all good counsels and all just works do proceed, give unto thy servants that peace which the world cannot give, that both our hearts may be set to obey thy commandments, and also that by thee, we being defended from the fear of our enemies, may pass our time in rest and quietness, through the merits of Jesus Christ our Saviour. Amen. Lighten our darkness, we beseech thee, O Lord. And by thy great mercy, defend us from all perils and dangers of this night, for the love of thy only Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, I know many in our community are missing the choir, uh, and I also know that the choir are missing being able to sing. So by small way of compensation, here is a chance to listen again to their performance of Love Bade Me Welcome from last term. <laughs> 